Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Just to trust his cleansing blood And in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing, cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Trust him more. I'm so glad I learned. Sting one, two. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise And to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood and in sin. How I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him.
before all time. Before I knew you, Jesus, before I could ever understand, you were already there, guiding me with your hand. Whoa. for my life and now I know that you always had this plan hey, hey. before I cried your name Jesus you were there Since the very beginning and all of time, this life and I know one day you'll take us all home. Yeah, but I can't always see it, your flowing power. So come, Holy Spirit, every hour, fill my soul and take me wherever you want me to go. Before I cried your name, Jesus, you were there. doubted you, you were still there. And when I needed you, desperately you were there for me, you set me free, you set me free. Thank you, Rob. That was beautiful. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to those of you who are online with us this morning as well. A song about remembering when God was there, and this morning we are gathered to remember that God is here with us as well. And today is kind of an odd day as it is also 9-11, and so today really is a day to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn and acknowledge that there's a lot going on yeah. in our hearts and minds, and that if we don't acknowledge that, it tends to get in the way of things, of our relationships with God and with one another. 
And so that's part of the process we go through in our worship time together as we pray together and confess our sins together and hear God's word together. I wanted to start you off this morning with a quote from Marilyn Robinson. I'm sorry I don't have in my notes the book that it's from. It's not one that I had heard of. She says, I experience religious dread whenever I find myself thinking that I know the limits of God's grace, since I am utterly certain it exceeds any imagination a human being might have of it. God does, after all, so love the world. Let us give thanks to God today. you are able as we join together in a responsive reading for the call to worship this morning. What shall we do in this holy place? Give, Give thanks, thanks to, God to God with, with whole heart. Come and let us recount God's wonderful deeds. We will worship God with our whole selves. Let us sing praises and glorify God's holy name. Wonderful creator and God, meet us here in this time and place. Help us to worship and praise you in the way that will please and honor you. As we lift your name, be glorified. Let our worship and thanksgiving not be confined just to this moment and place, but be in all times and all places. Let our whole lives be worship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown Rise on the praises, rest on the brow of the King of the Ages. Raise up the crown, rise on the praises, rest on the brow of the King of the Ages. Well, that with yonder sacred throne. There we go. That with yonder sacred throne, we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown. Rise on the praises, rest on the brow of the King of the Ages. Raise up the crown, rise on the praises, rest on the brow of the King of the Ages. Our prayer of confession today is going to be multi-sensory. There, um, there are two refrains. One is, great God, we are sinners. And the other is, turn us around. And so what I would invite you to do today is every time that I say, God, we are sinners, to either turn around toward the back of the room, or if it would work better for you, to place your hands over your eyes to approximate the idea of not being able to see to the front. And then every time I say, turn us around, turn back to the front of the room or 
remove your hands from your eyes. And now our prayer of confession. Great God, we are sinners. We get things wrong. Sometimes it is like we are facing the wrong way, dreaming the wrong dreams, working toward the wrong goals. Turn us around so that when we face you, dream your dreams, work toward your goals. Great God, we are sinners. Too often we are selfishly grabbing the most food, the prettiest clothes, and the coolest games for ourselves. Turn us around. Teach us to share what we have. Give us generous hearts. Great God, we are sinners. Too often we think only of ourselves. We think about what we want, what we like, what we think. Turn us around. Teach us to see all of the people around us. Help us recognize what people in our families and our friends want and need and hope. Help us to learn to take care of them and their needs. Great God, we are sinners. Too often we hate. We hate people who are not like us. We hate people who make our lives even a little harder. We hate people who get in our way. We hate people we just do not like. Turn us around. Teach us that people who are not just like us are your children and worthy of our friendship. Show us how to make friends with those who do not agree with us. Great God, we are sinners. We know it, we admit it, and we want to change. Turn us around to face you, to become your children, to be part of your kingdom. We bring our confessions to you and ask for your help in turning around to follow Jesus. We will now pause for silent reflection. Let us rejoice in knowing that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. In your pew Bibles, that can be found on page 850. Hear the word of the Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I invite the kiddos up for our children's sermon today. Hello, everybody. I have a pocket full of goodies today. It's not candy, but it's toys. And some people might say that I took these toys from my kid's toy drawer. But what I would say is that I took these toys that were mine and borrowed them back after having them on loan to my kids. Because I really did have these toys when I was a little kid. I probably got these between the years of 1983 in 1987, and I know that because that is when my parents were buying me a lot of Star Wars toys. So these are figurines from the movies. And I have four with me today, but we have another probably 10 at our house, and I had even more than that when I was a little kid. And I can imagine a conversation that my parents and I could have had similar to the conversation that Jesus was having with people today about things that are lost, that some folks find valuable, other folks don't find too valuable. Like, say I lost this green guy, right? Nobody really knows what this green guy's name is. But say I left this green guy at church underneath the pew because I was playing with him. And we got home and I realized, ah, oh, I forgot the green guy. I went to my parents, very panicked. Can we go back to church? I need to get the green guy. I need to get the green guy. And I bet my parents would have seen these, all of these, or at least most of these, as a collection, a large collection of toys. And they would say, we have bought you two dozen Star Wars figures. Some of them we paid $3 for, some of them we paid $5 for. This was not the Darth Vader with the cape and the retractable lightsaber. That means it was only a $3 one. Do we really have to go back and get it because it doesn't seem that valuable? And I would have said, yes, because you don't understand. I have this one that flies X-Wing ships, and I have this one that flies TIE fighter ships, and I have this one that flies the Millennium Falcon ships, and I need the green guy because he's the only one that can fly the A-Wing ship. And we would have this difference in perspective over how valuable this one guy is because in my mind, it would have been super valuable at that moment because it was the one that was lost. And I'd probably have some really big feelings until I got it back. And so Jesus and some Pharisees today, they're talking about this in regard to how we view other people's value. And Jesus is really trying to get them to understand that in God's eyes, we're not just like this big collection mass of people, but that we all have value. And we need to know that for ourselves, but we also need to know that, know that for all of the people that we come in contact with that they have great value in the eyes of God. So as Pastor Melissa is preaching today, and when she gives examples, I want you to think 
in your mind if it is a toy or perhaps a certain color of marker or crayon or a certain sticker or a book or a baseball card, whatever it is, what's something that you think would be super valuable that other people in your life might not quite understand how valuable it actually is. Let's pray. God, we thank you um, that you are big enough to see everything at once and also big enough to see each of us as individuals, that you created us that way, that you love us that way, and that you value us that way. As we dig into your word today, help it to transform us and not only be appreciative of who you are, but also help us be appreciative of those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Thanks, Christian. I was waiting to see how you were going to make Star Wars work with that. That was really good. I love how we can bring our joy to worship and learn from it. Even when it's Star Wars. Well, Star Wars, Star Wars has lots of good lessons in it. Years ago, before most people had GPS, there was a woman who went to New York to attend a conference that was being held in Carnegie Hall. And during her free time, she decided to go explore the city. And as you might expect, she got lost. Now this was before most people had GPS, but her rental car, you know, rental cars sometimes have the latest gadgets. Well, her rental car had OnStar. So she decided to try out the OnStar. Well, the OnStar was still new and so it took her down some roads that were closed and some roads that were dead ends. And so she decided she needed to do the things the old fashioned way and she stopped and asked a policeman. And she said to the policeman, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And he said, practice, practice, practice. Yeah, you all know this joke. It's an old joke, but it's a good joke with a good answer, because practice works. All of you who are teachers, and especially those of you that are music teachers and drama teachers, you know practice makes a difference, helps us to do things better. Repetition helps us to remember things. That's a little bit of what Jesus is doing in today's scripture as he tells two stories about finding things that are lost. Can practice help us with that too? He tells these two stories in response to the religious leaders who are grumbling about the company that he is keeping. And by now, they should have kind of figured out that this is what Jesus does. He's got a pattern going by this far into the Gospels. Uh, one of his first disciples that he calls was someone from the edges of society. Jesus does not avoid them. He calls them to be his disciples. One of the first was Matthew, the tax collector. Now, the religious leaders are concerned because their job to keep things following the Levitical laws, and the Levitical laws are about um, keeping oneself pure and holy so that you can participate in worship and go to the temple. And so associating with somebody who's not following those laws then would make you unclean. So you can see their concern. But Jesus keeps having to repeat to the religious leaders why he's doing this. They just seem to be missing the point. When Jesus called Matthew to be his disciple, Matthew threw a party and invited all the tax collector fr uh, friends to be there for the party. And the religious leaders, of course, objected, and they especially objected because he was eating with them. And if if a Jew eats food that's prepared by Gentiles, then the food is unclean, and so that's a whole nother problem. And Jesus explained then that his purpose was about going outside those usual circles. Jesus says in Luke 5, 32, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in today's scripture, Jesus is kind of practicing the same lesson again, telling them again with a little bit different approach, as again, the Jewish leaders are complaining that Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
And so he tells the two stories about finding lost things. And this time, he invites the religious leaders to put themselves in the story to help them kind of see the point here. So he says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, we could debate whether a shepherd would actually leave 99 sheep and go after the one, and maybe that's why he puts it this way, so that they are talking about it afterwards. So maybe that part's debatable, but the one about the woman says, what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Well, probably they would agree that's worth doing. And in other words, of course, we would all search for something as valuable as a sheep or a silver coin. But people are more valuable to God than even these things. And when they are found, there is great rejoicing. And everybody says, yay! Come on, you can say it with me. Yay! Good job. Because in Romans 12, Paul reminds us, encourages us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And the religious leaders are really missing the boat here. They could have been rejoicing with Jesus that he's tra finding and transforming these tax collectors and sinners. They could have joined the party, but they just weren't seeing Jesus as who he truly was, God in the flesh. They were seeing him as someone who's breaking the rules. And they probably wouldn't have liked that Jesus told the story in which God is a shepherd or a woman. It's a metaphor for, a, for God that a shepherd is the one who goes searching, but shepherds are too uncouth to be a metaphor for God, and a woman is too weak to be a metaphor for the all-powerful God, right? Wrong. But that's what they might have said. And that's the picture is that Jesus is painting with these stories. God pursues lost people. God pursues us. One of the best verses for seeing this is the beautiful one that's the end of the 23rd Psalm where he says, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Some of our versions say will follow me but the word there, really, the stronger meaning translation there is pursue. God pursues us. God's unfailing love chases us down, as one of the songs says. And it's a good thing God does, because we are prone to wander and to panic when we get lost. And this is what happened to a woman who was hiking the Appalachian Trail. Her name is Jerry Largay. She was a 66-year-old retired nurse. She had wanted for years and years to hike the 2,100-mile trail that goes from Georgia to Maine. And uh, so she had planned carefully. Well, she was missing for two years until a surveyor stumbled upon her camp. And in this camp, he found a collapsed tent, a skeleton inside a sleeping bag, and a backpack with a cell phone and a journal. And it was using these that authorities were able to piece together, for the most part, what happened to Jerry. She had planned the trip really well. She was hiking with a friend. Um, they had uh, mapped out their route. Her husband was shadowing them in the car, and they had prearranged stopping points where they would meet up with him to check in and to get restocked, resupplied. And then a family emergency called her friend home. But since she was still meeting her husband along the way, they decided that Jerry could continue alone. But one day when she went off the trail to go to the bathroom, she got disoriented by the trees and the thick undergrowth and was unable to find her way back. When Jerry didn't show up at the next rendezvous, her husband alerted the uh, warden service for the park and Professional rescuers and trained volunteers were searching for her for weeks with no success. It was 26 weeks later when that surveyor found her camp. And so they were able to determine from the phone and the journal 
that she had texted her husband many times, but she was in an area that had no cell service, so he never got the texts. And she'd heard the spotter planes and the helicopters, but she was in an area where the growth was so thick that they couldn't see her. She lit fires, they didn't see them. And her last campsite was only half a mile from the trail, but she didn't know it. And we, they don't really know exactly why, but likely she just panicked and couldn't get beyond it and couldn't find her way back. And we are prone to go in circles, even if we mark the trail sometimes. So they found this note in her journal. When you find my body, please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me, no matter how many years from now. Please find it in your heart to mail the contents of this bag to one of them. It's kind of a sad story. It shows how off track we can get sometimes. The problem is that when we are lost, we do panic and we don't think clearly, and we do tend to walk in circles. And uh, apparently, it, part of the reason for that is that none of us have legs that are exactly the same length. Who knew? Anyway, that's why the advice when you're hiking is to stay put and wait for someone to find you. But we're not very good at doing that. I've been lost a few times. I didn't stay put. Okay, I've been lost a lot, and I never stayed put. But anyway, that's why a really good verse to practice is Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. The Holy Spirit works in us through this verse. Along with some deep breathing, it can help us to think more clearly, kind of the way the woman cleared for the way for finding the coin by lighting a lamp and sweeping the floor. She was trusting that she would find it if she kept searching. The more we practice trusting God, the more our faith grows and the more we are able to trust God's possibilities. And our minds are changed. We, that word repent means to change our minds. And our minds are changed in subtle ways when we pray and meditate. It helps our brains learn to panic less. Studies have shown that prayer actually lowers our reactivity to traumatic events. Whether we are physically lost, emotionally lost, or spiritually lost, but maybe it's human nature that we do whatever we can to try to fix it ourselves. But when we are stressed, our decision-making can be impaired, and we need help. In the stories that Jesus tells us in today's scripture, he uses the word repent, and that word in Greek is metanoio, which means to change one's mind. When we're lost and afraid and panicking, our minds do need to change. We need to calm down. We often need help to calm down so that we can think more clearly. We need peace, God's peace, because God is never far away. And Psalm 139 is a good scripture to help us remember that, that God is always near. Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. What that psalm is telling us, 
and that I have found in my own life is that when it feels like we are lost and God is far away, it's our perception, not God's reality. We cannot hide from God. And so we do need to practice seeking and trusting God in all the ways that we do that, in prayer, in Bible reading, in having spiritual conversations with friends, Sometimes in prayer, we can be more honest about how we're feeling because we're talking to God, and that can help us to sort out how to explain to someone else what's happening and have someone else help us to figure out what we need to do next. Sometimes prayer helps us to settle down enough to see a situation differently, to see new possibilities. Now, honestly, I didn't set out for this to be a sermon about prayer, and so I kind of want to give you a caveat, because I don't want that to be the only way we think of getting help when we feel lost, because sometimes we are beyond prayer. I don't think I will ever forget the day that I went to Rob and said that I was so tired of trying to keep going like everything was okay, and that was the day he asked if he could make an appointment for me with the doctor, and I'm very glad that he did. I'm very glad that I said yes, because it was the beginning of changing my mind, of repenting and admitting that I needed help. And though I have a lot of scriptures stored in the little crevices and cracks of the brain, the only one that I was hearing during that time was Galatians 6, 9, don't give up. Because when we're panicking, when we're feeling lost, that's our inclination sounds easier to give up. God says, don't give up. Now today it is 9-11, and you may already have seen on, on TV the memorial service in New York. It's a pretty dramatic service and a pretty dramatic memorial. That 9-11 memorial in New York City is a great example of not giving up. Great care has been taken over the years to identify all the remains And the process of DNA matching continues to this day. The names of everyone who died are engraved on the memorial, and not just in some easy order. They took care to connect with the families and find out who knew each other, who worked together, and those names are grouped together on the memorial. The memorial is a plaza where they've planted 400 swamp oak trees, because that's the kind that's most common there and the most resilient, but there's one tree that's different. The survivor tree is a calorie pear tree that was found on the site as they were clearing the rubble. The tree was burned and badly damaged and nearly dead, but the New York City Parks and Recreation took it somewhere where they could nurse it back to health and cared for it, and now it has a place of honor in Memorial Park. And here's my favorite part about this. Every year, they take seedlings from that tree, that survivor tree, and send them to cities that have experienced tragedies. And so that tree in the park there is a living reminder, excuse me, Uh, an example of resilience and survival and resurrection, not just to the people there who come to New York City, but everywhere they send those seedlings. And then probably the most dramatic part of the memorial, of course, are the giant reflecting pools that are built in the footprint of the Twin Towers. Probably the most dramatic pictures of them are from overhead where you can see how large they are. They are the largest man-made waterfalls in North America. And the way they're set up is so that the water continually flows down 30 feet and then into a black void in the center. The architect, Michael Arad, calls his design Visible Absence. I really love that title, Visible Absence. One of the reasons I really like it is it's a little bit like the empty cross that no longer has Jesus on it. His visible absence 
helps us to remember that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, that resurrection is always a possibility with God, that all things are possible with God. If God can do that, then we can trust God to help us in whatever situation we find ourselves in and to help us to help others to know God's great love as well. And this is what we celebrate every Sunday. And this is what we celebrate every day when the sun comes up and a new day dawns. Thanks, God. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for your amazing, faithful presence with us. Thank you that you are here with us in every moment, that you are here with us right now, holding on to us, holding us by the hand, surrounding us with your Holy Spirit and with your love and your grace. And God, we do turn, need you to turn us around to help us to change when we let things get in the way of knowing your presence or when things are just so hard that we need help. Thank you for all the ways that you send us help. Through your word, through your presence, through the beauty of this world, through the people around us, in ways that are too numerous to name, but which many of us have experienced and maybe naming in our hearts right now. And we thank you most of all for the most dramatic sign of all, your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly died for us and who you raised from the dead. And we thank you for helping us see that with you all things are possible. Amen. Come all you weary and ye broken Come to the table of the Lord Come sing the song of the forgiven Come lay your burden on the word Come and find peace Everyone needs a little rest Everyone needs a little joy And a song to sing in the darkest night And life, even when it gets you down Hope will turn it all around But love is the greatest of these Everyone needs a little saints and ye sinners call on the mercy of the Lord come sing the song of redemption sing about the hope that is to come come and find peace everyone needs a little rest Everyone needs a little joy And a song to sing in the darkest night And life, even when it gets you down Hope will turn it all around But love is the greatest of these Everyone needs a little He will lift you up He will lift you up Come and find peace. Everyone needs a little rest. Everyone needs a little joy. And a song to sing in the darkest night. And life, 
even when it gets you down. Hope to turn it all around, but love is the greatest of needs. Everyone needs a little. Everyone needs a little. Everyone needs a little. Everyone needs a little. Everyone needs a little prayer. And that's what we get to do together right now. And so I invite you to raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone around so you can let us know how we can pray with you today. And we want to make sure we don't undervalue your prayers at all. So today I'm going to write them on here. You should really pray for Becky right about now because I'm driving when we go to Wichita in a few minutes and that was not a good example of driving. <laughs> How can we pray with y'all today? George has got her hand up. Casey's coming. My mom and my family could really use your prayers. Mom has been struggling for some time now. She's been in and out of the hospital and, and in and in. And um, they know part of what's going on, but they don't know everything and they haven't figured out how to fix it. Um, so if you would keep her and my dad and my two sisters, Jane and Jean, in your prayers, that would be great. And along with that, um, my Uncle Kenny, Kenny Landis is his name, and I know y'all have never met him, um, but he recently had, this past week while my mom's in the hospital, he ended up in the hospital and he had to have surgery. I don't really know much of anything that's going on with him, but I know he had surgery, I know it has something to do with bowels, but they could really use some prayer. My Aunt Arlene is one who has had several strokes and she probably can't even be with him. And I know that's hard, very hard. So thank you. Thanks, Georgia. So Kenny is your uncle? Yes. Okay. He's the honorary one. Well, let's hope he's not watching today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we will keep your mom and dad in our prayer, and Jane and Jean and Kenny. Yeah, um, I would like uh, continued prayers for my nephew, Chris, who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's getting ready for his fifth treatment this week, and hopefully he'll be able to have it. They've been having trouble with platelets, and then he can't have a treatment if they're too low. So if you please... Continue, Christopher, in your prayers. And I have a strange request, and I wouldn't even say it, except I really need your prayers. I am, I'm so sorry. It's okay, take your time. Um, something has happened with my arms. They're both really, really, really sore. And um, I really need them. And maybe it's because I've used them so much, I don't know. But anyway, I just ask your prayers that um, we c I could get some relief and somehow, and if there's something that can help it, I am, or I'm still going to therapy for this arm, but um, they're gonna work on this one too. I'll probably have to go back to the orthopod and get a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a prescription for it. But I just ask, I ask your prayers, and especially there's so many things I do for Paul, and I, I just have to have my arms. So, and if not, help me, you know, go forth with joy. I don't know, but thanks for your prayers. Thank you, Carol. Uh, most of us know Carol, but in case any of you don't or online can't see that Carol's in a wheelchair, so arms are crazy important. Yeah, so we definitely keep that in our prayers. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, Shirley. 
I need your prayers that my grandson's bank will get in gear and increase the limit on his debit card so he can buy the materials, supplies he needs to get started on my roof. They're being kind of pokey at that. So I do need them to get it done because I don't need to lose the ceiling in my living room. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. We will keep Michael's bank in our prayers. Other prayers this morning. Our person that we're praying for this week is Jolene McFadden. We want to keep her in our prayers. And also we are praying for, um, in our Sterling churches, the Sterling Church of Christ. Did I miss something? Oh, okay. And I didn't see if we had online prayers, but do go ahead and put them in there, and we'll make sure and pick them up Um when we're putting together our prayer list. You can also email or uh, use Facebook Messenger to send us prayers. And we will make sure we are praying for y'all. Let us bow together in prayer. Loving God, we thank you that not only are you here with us, but you are with each one of these people and in each one of these situations. So we thank you that you are with George's mom and dad and Jane and Jean, with Kenny Landis and Chris, that you know how bad Carol needs her arms and how much Michael needs that access from the bank so that he can work on Shirley's roof. And God, you know all the other things that are going on in our lives that we haven't said out loud, sometimes that we can't even put into words. Speak to us now in a moment of silence and remind us that you hear those as well. And in all these places, God, we pray for comfort and wisdom, strength, healing, grace, inspiration, persistence, and resilience. God, we pray for the church that she may continue to provide care and healing for all, and especially for those who have been affected by those attacks that happened on September 11th. We pray to you, Lord. And we pray for all the victims of violence and terrorism around the world and for their families, that they may find comfort and peace. We pray to you, Lord. And we pray for the safety of our servicemen and women abroad, for our civil servants who protect us and keep us safe, and for all who live with war and violence. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for our leaders and for the leaders of nations that they may work together to address the problems that provide fertile ground for the growth of terrorism and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray for the ability to forgive and for an end to all hatred, beginning in our own hearts. We thank you that you have shown us the way through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And we ask your blessing upon us as we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Because you first loved us, because your glory shines, because you are the one worthy of our praise. Lift our hands and voices and sing your holy name because of you, because of you. Because upon the cross, because your glory shines, because the empty tomb leaves no one behind, we pray that all creation sees that in our eyes is you, Lord is you, and we stand and sing and bless your holy shines because the empty tomb leaves no one behind and we pray that all creation sees that in our eyes is you lord is you and we stand and sing i bless your holy name bless your holy name and we stand and sing sing and bless your holy name we bless your holy name and we stand and sing hallelujah lord hallelujah lord amen well as you go know that god does go with you and may people indeed see jesus in your eyes and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.